Good evening, my name is Scott McLean. I am a canard pilot. As you can see, I've got a picture. That's actually a model that, of my airplane that I took a picture of. I have a cozy Mark IV canard airplane, and I have a YouTube channel called Canard Boulevards. I got asked to come here and do a presentation, and I said, uh, what would you like my presentation on? They said, whatever you like. So I'm like, okay, well, uh, how about I'll talk about canard airplanes and YouTube. I'm gonna talk about canard airplanes and then how I actually fell into YouTube and some benefits and pitfalls that you will encounter uh, along that. I am a commercial multi-engine instrument rated pilot. I've been flying since I was two. <laughs> That's me on the right on the controls there. That's my, my father there who is Navy and in, uh, also an instructor and commercial pilot. My other brother there, Cameron on the left, did get his private license, flew gliders for a while. I have another brother who flies 737s for a living, so it's kind of in my family. The only person that doesn't fly is my mom. She's just a passenger. Growing up, we had a tri-pacer. We basically grew up and it was perfectly normal to just go flying to go see or go visit your uncle or go here and go there. Actually on the right there that's my other my youngest brother who now flies. He flew bush for about 12 years up in the Arctic uh, on skis, floats and and wheels and he also now flies 737s onto gravel runways up in the Canadian north. So I bet you didn't know that jets can land on gravel. So they have a great the 737 she knows. Did you go into Greenland landings? Like Greenland it, to land? Because I know they have... No, because no, everything he does is all in the Arctic North. He's now actually... He was working for Canadian North, but he now actually flies for Raglan Mines, and they have two 737 200s, old 200s, that they've... With the old turbojet engines, and they fly... He just goes up and down, moving people and supplies up, in the, up to the mine up the north. They can't put runways in because it's permafrost. So they have gravel. And the 737-200 is the only airplane that has a gravel kit available for it. And so it has, uh, on the on nose wheel, it has like, like almost like a snow plow that, that keeps the gravel away from the fuselage. And then in the front of each engine they sell, there is a, a, a bleed air probe that sprays bleed air out in front and sprays gravel so it doesn't go in, up into the engine. That is cool. So. You gotta say, that is cool. It's pretty close to the ground. Yes. Well, it, but is it turbojet? So it's not like the huge turbofans. The nacelles are only about that big around. So, um, but and it drinks. It, it, it will suck it in. But the, and they drink fuel. So we outgrew our tri pacer because three boys grow big, and so we ended up with a Cherokee 180, which my father had up until he stopped flying. He was in his 70s, lost his medical. So, actually, he lost his medical, sold the airplane then decided I really miss flying. So he went back, tried to get his medical, got it, because he's an A&P as well. He, he traded annuals and things for a friend of his that had a 150. So he tootled around on a 150 for a, a few more years until he, he lost his medical for good. And, and uh, now he just flies with us. So growing up, it wasn't like, hey, dad, can I borrow the car keys? It was, hey, dad, can I borrow the, the plane keys? And that's just was a way of life. And, and we didn't know any different. We didn't know that it was kind of anything special at all, really. 1991, I headed down to Macon, Georgia. I went to flight school with the idea, I'm going to become an airline pilot. So I went down there and did my, my uh, commercial multi-engine and, and started on my CFI. But at that point, huge recession. Every airline was furloughing pilots and there was 15,000 hour pilots, a dime a dozen that were willing to work for $10 an hour instructing. And I, I saw the tea leaves, what was in the future and realized that this is not going to work. I uh, moved back I, uh, up to uh, Washington DC and worked in IT and basically flew off uh, either rentals or I had quite a few friends that had airplanes. I had a friend with an Arrow, I had a friend with Navajo, a Mooney 252. And in fact, my friend with the Arrow just said, my airplane just sits there, it needs to be flown. Anytime you wanna go fly, I feel free and just fill it with fuel when you're done. So I had a, basically a free airplane to fly, which was nice. Of course, experimental airplanes. Uh, 1998 went up to Oshkosh. That's my father and I camping there at Oshkosh. Not only did I get to see Bob Hoover fly in his Shrike and do his routine, I got to meet him afterwards. Super nice guy. Got his book, he signed it for me. I got a bunch of stuff of his. I actually had another friend of mine who was a World War II veteran that flew B7, he was a bombardier in B-17s, later flew uh, Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War in B-52s. 
and was a friend of Bob Hoover's. So I, I, I mentioned his name is Jim Sanders, and I mentioned him to Bob Hoover. He's like, Sandy? So Chris ended up talking. That's what that was right there, is talking about Jim Sanders, my buddy. I got transfixed by experimental airplanes here, and the one that really got a like, twist in my head around was the velocities. First time I ever saw a velocity, and so I took all the stuff home. I'm like, all the plans and all the, the brochures. I'm like, I could build this. Uh, well, fast forward to just a few years ago, and now I'm in a, kids are grown and gone, and finance, you know, house is done. We can perhaps actually purchase an airplane instead of renting airplanes. So I started thinking, okay, what am I gonna do when I'm looking for an airplane? And of course, my wife approved that I could actually get an airplane. So I wanted something that was fast. My wife insisted on a four-seater because she wants to bring friends along. And I wanted to be efficient. So I thought, well, how about like a Grumman? I liked, I always liked the Grumman, the Tigers and the Cheetahs and everything. I thought they were pretty small, reasonably efficient, pretty fast, 130, 135 knots. But there's a huge problem with that is back in, when I lived in Canada, my dad was an A&P. He could just do all the work on the plane. So if, I, if he wanted help in the plane, I would get in there and I'd get my hands dirty. So I've worked on planes all my life. I can't touch this plane. I can change the oil on it but I can't do anything else to it. So I thought, you know what? I can't have a certified airplane. I need to go with something experimental. So I started looking at ex what experimental kits could I maybe build, maybe buy. What I was looking for, I wanted to have something that was fast, four-seater, I thought, you know what? A BD-4C, Jim Beattie's BD-4C, but ugly airplane, but simple to build, fast to build, pretty fast, 160 knot cruise on a, on a, with a IO 360 in it. They're proven. It is the very, very first kit plane ever produced in 1971. And there's many, many of them flying. It's basically a space frame with aluminum glued on it. And uh, it's like an erector set building it. it it's, it's really easy to build. So then I got, I thought, I'll go sit in one. I'll go try one out. And immediately, as soon as I sat in it, I thought, oh, this is gonna be a problem. Just like the, the Grumman, which is also a Jim Beattie design, it has a tubular spar carry through because the wing spar is just a big aluminum tube. Same design in the BD-4, actually the same design in all of Jim Beattie's designs, but it's a high wing. So that spar carry through is right in the cockpit. And as soon as I lean forward, it's like, Kunk. I'm like, this is not gonna work. I don't fit in this airplane. All right, so we need to, need to start over again. I went back and thought, yep. Yeah. Just cut the spar. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, okay, maybe a velocity will work. I always loved that velocity. I started looking at velocities. Build time, oh my God. 10 years, 12 years, that's not gonna work. Okay, let's, let's look at buying one. Quarter million dollars, 150,000, 200,000, hmm. That's a little out of my price range. Okay, so then I thought, well, maybe Canard is the way to go because it's, it's really fast. They're, they're relatively inexpensive to run. How about a long easy? So I, I, can't, I thought, this is perfect. It's small, you can buy them for $40,000. They're really fast. I told my wife, like, this is perfect. We can go to Florida nonstop. And, and uh, she's like, well, how many people sit in it? I'm like, um, well, two, it's, it's 10 and one behind the other. And she's like, no. I'm like, okay, well, the velocity, maybe there's a long easy that, how about a cozy? It has four seats, it's a long easy, but it's side by side, two and two. Maybe that would work. It's, same speed, bigger engine. It's got really good load. It's got a thousand pound usable load, 52 gallons of fuel. I can go a thousand nautical miles, burning 165 knots, burning only seven and a half gallons an hour. So it's efficient. All right, so do I build one or buy it? I do have a million projects on the go at all times. My wife vetoed building an airplane. So I did months and months and months of research into cozies. I found out everything you could find out about what the, the problems are, what you want to look for, changes that have been made along the way from the very first cozies as they found problems and changed them and fixed them. So I knew what I was looking for. I wanted a reasonably low time cozy. I wanted to make sure that it was built really well because it is a plans built aircraft, not a kit built aircraft. So you just get a big stack of books, of uh, plans, and you basically cut foam, glass, and build the thing from scratch. You, there's, there's some parts like nose wheel forks and engine mounts and things that you can actually purchase, uh, nose wheel pivots. So pre-made metal pieces, but for the most part, it's completely hand-built from scratch. 
So I wanted something with a reasonably decent glass panel as well. I grew up flying steam gauges, but I'd like to have a glass panel. So having this in mind, I thought this is going to take a really long time to find. I told my wife, I said, this is, it could be a couple years because there, there aren't a whole lot of these around and they aren't going to come up that often for sale. So, and, and to, when they do come up for sale, the chances that it's going to match what I'm looking for is pretty slim. So I said, expect it's going to be a couple of years. Then um, I was on Facebook, of course, watching the, the, the Cozy group, and I saw this airplane come up, and it was this airplane, 797 Delta Lima. I called the builder, and I started talking to him about it, and unfortunately, it was exactly what I was looking for. But I told my wife, I'm like, this is it. This is the airplane, but it's way too soon. We're not ready. And she says, well, can we afford it? I'm like, yeah. She's like, buy it. I'm like, okay. So I flew to, over, out to Wisconsin. I'm actually going back out there on Sunday. The uh, builder is a good friend of mine, so I'm going to go see him on Sunday. We're actually going to tear a wing off it. The magnetometer that's buried inside it needs to be adjusted. Anyway, so I flew out to Wisconsin, flew it, loved it, inspected it, bought it, did the uh, checkout with their instructor, flew it home. This past spring, I went and did the um, first condition inspection. Now, for as you know, with experimentals, if you build the experimental, you get a repairman certificate for that specific airplane. If you do not have a repairman certificate for that airplane, you can do all the work you, on the airplane, but for the condition inspection, which is the equivalent of the annual, has to be done by an AMP. It does not have to be an IA, just an AMP. And I knew uh, an AMP down in Florida, right next to my friend's house, who uh, knows canards, because there's another guy who has a long easy who's down there who's, who recommended him to me, so I flew down there. We tore the plane apart. I got a really good idea of how all different systems work, found a few issues and fixed them. I let him do the engine. I, I'm comfortable with the engine, but he, he found actually a, a couple things in the engine that I had never even found, so that was, that was good to see. I have done quite a bit of work to this airplane. When I got it, I found some electrical issues with, uh, there was a, a relay board that runs the trim and, and landing brake and uh, a few other things that it just wasn't working correctly. It wasn't documented. None of the wires were labeled, and so I, I ripped it out, designed a new one, put it in. So, and I, I do have other plans for it. Um, I've put in a backup battery for EFIS. I've put in a um, new alternator. So I've done a fair bit of work to this airplane. It has been extremely well used since I got it. Like I said, I've been flo flown to Florida three times. I flew it to Kentucky for uh, Rough River. Where, which is an annual gathering of all canards. Flown it to West Virginia, flown it to Ontario and back four times because my, my family all is in Ontario. Uh, that's one of the main reasons I got it was so I could go up and see my family. The fact that it's a seven and a half hour drive to go see my parents, I can do it in this airplane in 90 minutes. So it's, it's a time machine for me, really. Been to Maine. I'll be heading out to Maine again in a couple of weeks. Nova Scotia is a trip that I made last month. I have a video actually coming out about that on Saturday. I've, I've been all over in this plane. I've, I've put uh, 160 hours in the last year on it. So it's, it's been very well used. Of course, and for my dad. A lot of this was because of him. So I, I've been able to go up and, and fly with my dad, which was just great. He has a little bit of cognitive decline now and we can see what's coming. He's had several people in his family who have had Alzheimer's and dementia. So pretty sure that's, that's where he's headed. Unfortunately, and, and you can tell from talking to him, but he's had a lifetime of flying airplanes and you sit him in my airplane and he flies it just as well as I do. So that part of it is still right there in him. So that's, that's wonderful to see. Okay, I wanna talk about differences between the canard and a typical airplane. It's very slippery, very slippery and efficient. I have a 16 to one glide ratio. When I'm at idle, if the prop is stopped, it's about 13 to 1. As a comparison, a Cessna 172, you might get 7 or 8 to 1. So it's, it's pretty slippery. That means it's hard to come down and slow down at the same time. So if ATC dumps you at the last second, you're, you're in trouble because it won't do it. It does not have flaps. That means you are going to be landing fast. You can't put flaps on a canard like this. It's not that it's not possible, but you have to have it on the front canard as well as the main wing. There are ways around it. The Beach Starship has flaps, but they got around that by having the canard sweep and be able to move like, like a Tomcat. Just not practical for a small GA airplane. So no flaps on a canard. 
you don't have prop wash over your, your horizontal stabilizer. So on your Cessna, you're doing your soft field takeoff and you, you bring your power up and you've got the, the yoke in your lap and you've got that prop wash blasting your tail down to take the load off the nose wheel. Can't do that in a canard. So a canard is a hard surface airplane only. You do not land it on grass. You, you also likely will not get off the ground because uh, so much rolling resistance with the tiny wheels that you'll never get up to rotation speed. Basically, you can't horse a canard into the air. You basically have to wait until you get enough airspeed that the canard itself starts to, to fly. It will then lift up. In doing so, rotates the main wing angle of attack enough that it starts generating lift and then it comes up. So, like I said, you need long runways, long hard surface runways. 2,700 feet is pretty much my personal minimum for this airplane in and out. A little more if there's a crosswind because it's a free castering nose wheel. So you're gonna be using some brake. And it's, particularly if you're doing a crosswind takeoff, you need to drag a little bit of brake in order to keep it tracking straight, which means your takeoff run is gonna be that much longer. Uh, longer is better. I typically, with myself, 1,500, 1,600 feet, I'm off and I can usually land at about the same. To have a safe accelerate stop, I say 2,700 is my, my personal minimum. Over rotation, bad. Basically, if you uh, over rotate it up in the, in, in the air, basically, if you get the canard above the horizon, your prop's gonna be carving slices out of the runway and it lands flat. Um, you do not flare. Again, for the same reason, if you come in and, and you try to land it like a Cessna and, and flare it, you're gonna be hitting prop first. You basically land like a jet. You, you come in, you arrest the descent, just hold it there and just wait for it to stop flying and it just will basically land itself. It's, it's not hard, it's just different. It is quieter. Um, the engine's in the back, so you don't have the big engine a couple feet in front of you and you don't have a prop beating the air into submission four feet in front of your face. So for you, it's quieter. For everybody else on the ground, not so much because you have air coming over the main wing. It's getting all disturbed and that's going directly into the prop. And so apparently it makes a very strange noise that people, everybody knows I'm coming. I've obviously not heard it, but that's what I'm told. But I, I, when I fly in and see my parents, she, my dad says, oh, I always know when you're coming. Says, I, I know your plane sound. Like I said, it flies like any other airplane. It's taking off and landing is a bit different. This is a... Uh, where am I? I think is St. John's, New Brunswick. So you basically apply power and you wait. Does it have rotor pedals? Yes, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And once you get up to about 65 knots, you just a little bit of back pressure and you'll see the, the elevators on the canard will just move down a little bit. And you'll see the nose just gets a little bit light right there and then just bring it up and just and then as soon as it comes up, you just kind of like relax pressure, let it come up, gear up. And then from this point on, it just flies like any other airplane. Sorry? Stick or yoke? Side stick. Side stick. Yep. And it is, unlike a Cirrus, it's not an in-out kind of side stick. It's, it's like an Airbus. It's, it just it moves just in that uh, two dimensions. Rudder pedals. I do have rudder pedals. It's a little bit different uh, because there's two rudders on the on each vertical stabilizer and they move outward. And they effectively are um, vertical airfoils. And so what you're doing is effectively creating, er, deploying a flap on the rudder that then generates lift and pushes that tail in one way or the other. And then as if, and if you push um, farther, then you engage brakes. So you can use that in a couple of ways. Uh, obviously you're gonna be using your brakes uh, at low speed on your takeoff run to use your directional steering. Once you get enough airspeed that the rudders became, become active, you can then use those to steer. You can also use them as air brakes because you can push both rudders out at the same time. So when you're coming into land, I'll typically be on both rudders and both rudders will be pushed out and it kind of helps you come down. All right, aerodynamics. Canards are stall proof. I say stall proof. If you are not an idiot, a canard is stall proof because the angle of incidence on the canard is higher than the main wing. So in any kind of operation within your envelope, the canard will always stall first and it has to stall first. And all that happens is the canard will just drop a little bit and it, and it starts flying again. And then if you, if you pull the stick back, you can pull the power back, pull the stick all the way back, it'll go up 
and it comes down. And it does this about once per second. That's your stall. Um, and while it's doing that, if you want to haul a stick over and kick the rudder and do something that would cause, cause any other airplane to spin, all it does is turn. So it's, as long as you're within your CG envelope, you cannot stall this airplane. You can be on your base to final turn, and if you like, oh, I overshot, you can crank it over, pull it back, and it, it might stall it, and you'll do this, but you aren't going to stall spin. So it's very safe in that way, unless you load aft CG. If you load aft CG, you now don't have enough uh, weight on the canard, which means it's not going to stall before the main wing. And if the main wing stalls, it's not recoverable. It will go into what's called a deep stall. And basically the airplane comes down like this. And there's no forward airflow, so the control surfaces are, are ineffective. There are several people who have done this and actually survived, because it's only coming down at about 35 miles an hour. I don't recommend it, but <laughs> there's actually one guy that did manage to recover it, and he did that by, as it was coming down, he started kicking the rudders and leaning at the same time, and he actually had his passenger do it. And so they started just kicking it and got it doing a little bit of a Dutch roll, until, and they just kept doing it and doing it, and they had enough altitude where it finally fell over and got enough airspeed over the canard that he could shove the nose down and then recovered. So it's possible, but so I only know that's been done once. Um, the CG envelope on a canard is much narrower because you have weight distributed between those two wings. Uh, if I am solo, I have to carry ballast up front. I might, I'm limited to 420 pounds in my front seats. It's actually pretty easy to load because the fuel and the back seats are right on the, on the, you can load it up all you want and it doesn't affect the envelope. So your envelope load in terms of loading is all front seats and ballast. Okay, it's smaller. If you look at it compared to a Cessna 172, the overall size of the fuselage, the surface area is much, much smaller. So there's much less parasite drag. You, we have a bigger engine than a Cessna but much, much less fuselage, so there's way less parasite drag, so less to push through the air, less, more speed from less power. We don't have an engine in front, obviously. That means that instead of having this huge propeller and then a huge engine that is blocking all this air, we, have, we can have a very tapered kind of nose here, which is very much more streamlined. And also, that means that the seats are lower. Because in a Cessna, you have to be able to see over top of that engine. And the engine has to be up high on the thrust line, which means the seats have to be up high so that you can see over the glare shield, which means you have to sit upright, which means a whole lot of frontal area. We don't have to have any of that. So in my airplane, the seats are reclined. You're sitting way back and your feet are way out in front of you. And it's very much more streamlined. So again, much less drag. We are all lift. There is no downforce required. Conventional Cessna, we have downforce on the tail, on the horizontal stabilizer, and we have lift being generated by the main wing. So not only are we have negative lift on the tail, now we have to generate extra lift on the wing to overcome what's on the tail. Now, and of course, the byproduct of lift is drag. So now we're creating drag to create downforce plus extra drag on the wing to create extra lift to overcome the downforce. Instead, we're all lift. So we have to generate less overall lift, which means less overall drag, which means more speed from less power. All right, so that, that's my, uh, my quick and dirty canard aerodynamics speech. It gets a lot more complex than that. Technically, it's not 100% efficient all lift because some of the, the air that's disturbed by the canard then goes over the main wing, which in the main wing then has to be a slight bit larger in order to uh, generate lift because there is a disturbance in the inner part of the, of the strake of the, the delta portion of the wing, but nuances and so on. You can also see the, uh, the vertical stabs at the back have to be um, way, way back in order to get enough leverage that it can actually position and, and steer the airplane, which means in order to do that, we have to have a swept wing. Now we have a swept wing, so now we have span-wise flow. Okay, now we have Vortilons to prevent this. So it's, it's kind of a compromise, a compromise, a compromise. It's, it's the best combination of compromise, but it works. I get 165 knots true, 180 horsepower at seven and a half gallons an hour. So it, it definitely works. All right, so that's my aerodynamics. Then I was gonna talk a little bit of YouTube. 
why YouTube? I started out riding motorcycles for 35 years. I founded a forum called Goldwing Docs like 12 or 14 years ago. And I was using it to teach people how to fix their, their motorcycles. And I thought, well, I'll create, I was trying to like create these tutorials and I thought it's way easier if I just do it on video. Okay, I'll create a little YouTube channel and then I can post videos there and link them from the forum and uh, show people how to fix their, their motorcycles. And now it has 25,000 subscribers and it was never planned. So I quit motorcycles a couple years ago because um, it was no, not fun anymore. Because every time I go out, someone's trying to kill me driving like this with a phone in their hand. Honestly, every single time I went out, I was having to do emergency maneuvers to get out of some idiot who was trying to kill me. So I, I quit after 35 years. So then I also have a, a synthesizer channel because I've been doing synthesizers and playing in bands and whatnot for another 35 years or so. That's my home studio. And I created a synthesizer channel, teach people how to do synthesizers. Another 25,000 subscribers. Again, wasn't planned, just kind of happened. Those channels take a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to create and come up with videos. And so uh, when I got this airplane, the builder asked me, he says, oh, are you gonna do a channel on, on, on the canards? I'm like, no, I don't have the time. He's like, oh, maybe you could just throw a video up, you know, once in a while. Then I could see the, the airplane still flying. I'm like, fine, I'll, I'll do that. I'll just throw the occasional video up and, and then he can see it. So it's now my fastest growing channel. As of uh, two days ago, it, was, it hit 6,000 subscribers and that was after a year. So I guess I have a, another YouTube channel that I never intended to have. Um, sorry? I just subscribed. <laughs> okay, 6,001. 6,002. <laughs> I wanted to talk about benefits and, and drawbacks about having a YouTube channel. The one of the good benefits is obviously you make money. This is the Canard Boulevard from the last month. And it actually does better than some of the other channels because you, it depends on the target audience. And apparently the target audience for the airplane channel is more affluent than for the synthesizer and motorcycle channels. So it makes almost double. But this is, this is 6,000 subscribers for a month. So yes, you, you, you can make, it's, I mean, it's not live off money, but it's, it's not zero. That'll pay my, my fuel, you know. Some benefits, I get exposure. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, it's, it's, it's taken a little bit of getting used to about walking into an aviation event. Everybody walks up and they know me. Uh, it's, it was really weird at first. I'm, I'm, little more comfortable with it now, but I was really uncomfortable with it at first. It's a weird sensation. Uh, again, helps foster aviation. I, and I've come to recognize that the channel actually does that. There are a lot of people on there who are interested in aviation, but are not pilots or are thinking about becoming pilots and have questions or are just flight sim guys and they think and they want to know about flying how is this going to be different. I've recognized that it is definitely an outlet for helping foster aviation. I get to learn a whole lot. There have been experts, because I'm no expert. I mean, I know a lot, but there are many, many people that know a lot more than me, especially about this airplane. I just did a video where I was fixing something, because I put a lot of maintenance on there as well. And he says, um, it looks like one of your heat shields is pushing up against one of your push rod shrouds, and uh, it might, you might be checked at, because it, it could wear through there, and you could lose oil. And I'm like, you saw that? How did I not see that? So I went, and he was right. So that was interesting. And I've had other Canard owners say, what you said is right, but here's a better way of doing it. So I, there's been a lot of that type of stuff where I have actually learned quite a bit from other people who have posted on there, uh, on my channel. This is a big one. I didn't realize how many people out there who are building airplanes or that are learning to fly were watching my channel and using it as motivation, especially the guys building. They're like, yeah, you're, that video, he, I, I went back and I got back to work because it's really motivated me to finish because I want to get flying and doing what you're doing. None of this. I had no, no idea that any of this was going on or I had planned. It just kind of happened and it's, it's really good to see. Obviously, for my father to watch. He can't fly anymore. He lives vicariously through my brother and I. He has flight aware notifications set up so that every time either of us takes off, he's got his phone, he's watching to see where we're going, he's checking the weather for us. And so he's living through us. So a lot of the videos I put up, I do so with in, in mind that, hey, this is my dad gonna be watching this. Again, helps build the community. Okay, uh, drawbacks about doing a YouTube channel. It takes a long time. It's a lot of work. The video I just shot, or just 
that's coming up on Saturday going to Nova Scotia. I had 16 hours of video to edit, raw video, and it probably took me 30, 35 hours of work to edit it into a cohesive piece of video. Not all, that's, that's an exception. That's, that video is 70 minutes long. That's not normal. But pr it's pretty typical that, that it does take quite a bit of time. I'll, I'll probably spend between four and eight hours per video just in editing together uh, the original footage. Sometimes it's tough to come up with a decent idea. You can only go up and say, hey, I'm gonna go practice landing so many times. The best idea is to come up with a story. If you just go up and put a camera in your, in your airplane and go do some takeoffs and landings, Nobody's going to watch it. It's, you'll see it once, but it's just repeated. I try to come up with a narrative and a story, even if there isn't one to begin with. I'll watch the footage through and I'm like, oh, actually, you know what? This happened. And then the controller did this. And then, hey, this guy did that. Okay. And then, and then we had a problem here. And then this light turned off. So, you know, get a workout, a story arc. You can't really pre-script this stuff, but you can sometimes derive a story out of it. And when you work that into the video, it makes it more cohesive and it makes it more watchable. Just putting up clips of random flying, you won't get to the point where you're actually monetizing and making money out of it. YouTube rewards regular uploads. I upload every week. If you start skipping a week and skipping every other week and maybe a month here and there, your viewership will tank, your revenue tanks. So they punish if you don't and they reward you if you do. The more often you post, the more traffic they will funnel to you, you the better you'll do. They really want to motivate you to create create content in that way. They don't come out and say it, but that's what they do. Nutcases, there are nutcases. There are, <laughs> I swear. I get, there's a guy on my channel who thinks I am sending him messages in my videos. And, are you? No. <laughs> and I, I'm a little bit scared of him because he, every time I post a video, his, I, his comment is something about, I understand the message. I see what you're trying to do. I'll take, it, it's like he's, living in La La Land, but there are guys like that out there. And then there's trolls who just have nothing better to do than to write nasty things. My hair was really long up until a couple months ago, and I would get hair comments like, who does, you, you know, just stupid stuff. <laughs> you know, you can't waste your time on it. You can, there's three options you can do. You can engage with them, which is the wrong thing to do. You can ignore them, and they typically will go away, or just delete them you block them. If you engage them, that's what they want and it will just escalate, don't do it. It's really tough to guess what will hit. I've done videos where I put my heart and soul into it. I thought this is the best thing I've ever done and it just fell flat. And then I've done a video where I'm like, I just went up flying and there was a bird and there's nothing much to it and I threw it together in half an hour and put it up there and it got 30,000 views. I'm like, <laughs> what the hell? So you, you never know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the big one, FAA. You gotta be really careful about what you post on YouTube. There are, how do I say, call them a kind word. People with, who don't have anything better to do, who will examine your videos for any possible violation of FAA regs, and then they will call the FAA and report you. They, and the FAA knows it, and typically when it happens, the FAA, you'll get a call from your FISDO, and let's say, we got this report. I got one because uh, I had edited a video together, and the audio video sync was off by like 10 seconds when I was landing. And so I called clear of an uncontrolled airport. I called clear of the runway, and it looked like I was still on the runway, right? I just turned off to, a, to an exit and was still in the runway and said clear of 27 or whatever. He called the FAA and reported that to the FAA. I got a call from the FISDO. I explained what was going on. They're like, yeah, I know. We get these calls all the time, but I have to call just to let you know. You're going to get that kind of crap. I go through my videos and just make sure that there's nothing in there that could be construed as that way. And don't go out breaking FAA regs and putting it on YouTube. I mean, duh. Don't jump out of your airplane and film it and put it on YouTube and parachute out of your airplane. <laughs> What an idiot. How about flying under bridges? Yeah, exactly. Uh, suggestions, ignore the camera when you're in the airplane. I have a camera in there, I ignored it. 
there's times where I've put done like a monologue or I'm trying to explain something and I'll have like a second camera and I'll, I'll talk to it maybe if I'm in cruise or something. But for the most part, I fly like there's no camera there. I'll take the footage afterwards and see if I can get anything usable out of it. You can put multiple cameras in your plane, but doing so means you have twice the video to edit and will take twice as long. It makes the videos a little more watchable, but uh, it's a lot more work. You can, yeah, you can, you can pay people to edit videos. There are people that do that for a living. If that's what you want to do, then that's, that's great. I have, I've done it for years and I'm pretty fast at it. When you're paying other people to edit videos, obviously you have to come to an understanding of what kind of feel and style you want to use. There's gonna be a lot of back and forth. If they're not pilots or don't know about aviation, they may, there may be parts in there that they don't recognize as being usable or, or valuable. On the video from the Saturday, there was one point where ATC came on the channel and they were talking to an airliner and they wanted to wish a happy birthday to the controller's daughter who was on the plane. So I thought, oh, that's cute, so we'll put that in. But would the editor recognize that? And I don't know. Be outgoing, because it is show business. So if I've seen videos, there's a guy building a, a BD-4 and oh God, I can't watch his videos because he's like, so, uh, I'm going to put, uh, here's, the, here's the, the pliers, uh, I, I'm just going to rivet this, uh, and every other word is uh, and it's deadly to watch. And of course, nobody watches it because nobody can stand it. So you got to be Mr. Entertainment. Thumbnail images, description, super important. A bad thumbnail can make or break a video. YouTube, you can actually make now three, three thumbnails and it will test them. Whichever one gets the most views, it will then select. But I have, in the past, when I've had a video that's tanked, look at the video, look at the description, change them and, and, until it starts working. And, and that sometimes that works. Uh, ignore the trolls. That was it. Um, questions? Is that a bird retained design? It is a, it's designed by Nat Puffer. It's derived from the Long Easy. So there's Long Easy design elements in it. Uh, there are parts of it that are licensed from Burt Rutan because they are from the Long Easy. Some things that came over from the Long Easy like the nose gear unfortunately came over into this one. That's actually something that that Rutan actually said he wished he'd done differently in, in the Long Easy. If you are familiar with the Long Easy, you will feel very at home working on this plane because there's a lot of things that are the same. Back to um, <clears throat> aerodynamics, uh, does the rain bother a canard? Okay, so there are two different canards that uh, encountered this. The original canard used on the Very Easy and at the, on the first long easies was called a GU profile canard. And when it got contaminated from rain, it would lose considerable lift. As a result, you had to predict when you were gonna hit rain and make sure that you were ready to trim. And some of them, if you had a heavy front load and you flew through rain, your airplane turned into a lawn dart. They changed from the GU canard to what's called a Ronts canard and it does not have that problem. It does lose a little bit of lift when it gets contamination from rain. I flew mine through a heavy, heavy rainstorm out just outside of Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. I felt I, it pitched down just like a little bit. I trimmed it back, got through the rain, came back up. So, I tri so it was like minor, it was, but it was enough that I noticed it. No other questions? All right, thank you. Very good. Seriously, thank you. <laughs>